So let's talk about questions. When you want to ask somebody something, it's not always easy to find the right way to approach it. And the right way doesn't just depend on the topic. Who you're addressing also matters. Kids are very different from adults in more than just size, and so you can't look at them the same way. So how do we bend our linguistics techniques to suit the way kids do things? I'm Moti Lieberman, and this is The Ling Space. Welcome to the Ling Space. Kids may be really great at language learning, but compared to adults, it's much harder to get at what they know. We've talked about this before when it comes to babies and their linguistic knowledge, and that does present some special problems. But you'd figure once kids get talking, it'd be a piece of cake to work out what they can do. You would just ply them with questions, and then they would let loose with everything that they know. But no. Testing non-baby kids and testing adults is still really different. Part of this is just that kids don't have the same ability to think about what they're thinking that adults have. So you can't just ask them whether a sentence is good or not, or whether a combination of sounds is a possible word for their language. Their brains can't really handle that yet, so you'll probably just get blank stares, and maybe some crying. So that gets rid of grammaticality judgments and rating systems as experimental techniques. But even accounting for that inability to think about their own language use, some linguistic tests are still not appropriate to use with kids. They generally just have lower attention spans and memory capabilities than adults do. You might be able to sit a 25-year-old down with a battery of boring tests and just expect them to plow through, but try that with the 5-year-old and they'll just blow all of your papers around the room. Tests for kids have to be fun and engaging or you won't get anywhere. Challenges like these aren't going to stop enterprising linguists, though, and we've come up with a bunch of different approaches that can get exactly what kids can do. One easy way to keep kids engaged is to get them to play, and what easier way to get them to play than just to have them start moving things around? That's the idea behind the Act Out task. Put out some toys for the kids to play with, and then have them show you exactly how they understand their sentences by literally showing you. So for example, let's say that you want to know how children understand passive constructions. Maybe you already know what a passive is, but just for a quick reminder, in a normal active sentence, the subject comes before the object. So like, the monk rides the bison. But in the passive, you flip the object over to the beginning, adjust the verb, and if you feel like it, you can stick the subject down by the end. So like, the bison was ridden by the monk. If you process that right, you should get out pretty much the same meaning. Now, since active sentences are more common and their word order is more frequent, we might expect that they're easier for kids to pick up. But how could we show that? Well, you could just try getting the kids to act out the sentences for you. If they've got passives down, and they know they have to flip the order of who's doing what to whom, then they should be able to act everything out right. So here, if you give kids a little toy monk and a toy bison, they should do the same thing for both. The monk goes on the bison and then flies away. Exciting. But when you think about it, maybe that sentence isn't really the best way to test whether kids know how the passive works. Kids already know a good amount about the world, beyond whatever their language capabilities are. And they know that while a monk might be able to ride on something big like a bison, a bison isn't exactly likely to hop on the shoulders of a human monk, no matter how powerful that monk might be. So even if they don't really have a grasp on the passive, they may still be able to work things out. That's why linguists also make use of reversible passives. Reversible passives are sentences where both the subject and the object are totally capable of performing that verb. So take, for example, the pilot was kissed by the detective. Now, detectives can kiss pilots, and pilots can kiss detectives, and so real-world knowledge can't help you if you don't know how the passive really works. For an irreversible passive, like our sentence with the monk and the bison, you could work these things out on your own. But for a reversible passive, if you don't have a grasp on the grammar, you'd probably have the pilot do the kissing, and you'd be wrong. So what do kids do with these sentences? Well, in one study, linguists had five- and six-year-olds use toys to act out active sentences, as well as reversible and irreversible passives. Now, kids didn't really have any trouble with the active sentences, even if they could get a bit silly. But for the passive sentences, their acting skills turned out to be significantly better when you had monks riding on bison, rather than detectives kissing pilots. So reversible passives are definitely harder than irreversible ones. But that one year is an important amount of time. By six, the kids were really starting to get the hang of the passive, and they did well with both kinds. But trying to get kids to do things, whether it's act something out, or say a sentence, or whatever, has a real problem. Performance factors. 
Maybe you've noticed when you learn a new language that trying to express yourself is a lot harder than just understanding what's going on. Well, it's even harder when you're a little kid. They don't have a complete grasp on the language, and testing is stressful, and they don't have as many cognitive resources to draw on. Maybe they mishear part of the instructions, or there are too many things to keep track of, or the sentence structure just got too complicated. But there are a lot of reasons why, if you just look at what kids say and do, you can't get a complete picture of what their linguistic abilities are, no matter how many toys you give them to play with. So instead of looking at their production, acquisition researchers have tried to get a look at how they comprehend sentences. If we try to gauge their understanding, we won't have to worry about the pressure to produce things right. But there's still one big thing to think about when we're designing our experiments. Adults are scary. And kids, when they get uncomfortable, just want to say yes to all the scary researchers' questions so that they can get the thing over with and just go home. But if they just say yes to get out of disappointing the linguist, then that's not going to tell you much about what exactly kids can do. So you give them cases where they have to say no. That's the idea behind the truth value judgment task. Here, the experimenter will perform a little skit for the kids using toys or puppets. And then you have someone else describe what happened in the skit, with the sentence construction that you're interested in. Often this will be another puppet, because seriously, a cute little fire fairy puppet is way less scary than an adult. And then the kid has to say whether they agree with the puppet and why. Let's make this more concrete using an example, looking at how kids interpret pronouns. Here's a story you could use for this kind of task. Three people, Cora, Lynn, and Sue, decide to have a contest to see who's the best at bending metal. Then they ask their friend Asami to judge. All three do their metal bending, and Asami starts with checking on Cora. After looking at Cora's results, Asami says, sadly, she's not the winner. Then Asami moves on to Lynn. Asami looks at it closely and says, hmm, this is very nice, and you might be good enough to win, but I need to see Sue's first. So Asami goes on to Sue's medal. She examines it and says, okay, Sue, yours is a bit better than Lynn's, and so you win the competition. But Lynn gets angry and says that hers was definitely better than Sue's, and so she takes a second ribbon for herself. Okay, that's our story. And now we want to know whether kids will agree with our puppet when it says, I know what happened, she thinks that Lynn is the best metal bender. Is this a good description? Take a second to think about it. Ready? So let's unpack this. The only way that this sentence could be true is if she is Lynn, since Lynn is the only one who called herself the best. But that's not actually a possible interpretation. The syntax doesn't let you have she and Lynn be the same person. So the sentence has to be false. She should be Asami, who is the judge here. And Asami thought that Sue was the champion. If the kid's syntax is the same as the adult syntax, then they should reject the sentence and say no. She thought Sue was the best metal bender. But if it's possible for the kid to accept the sentence, then they should. After all, then they get to say yes and not disappoint any grown-ups. Some of the early results about whether kids interpreted pronouns the same as adults were murky, and so there were a lot of hypotheses that maybe they didn't, maybe they just had to grow into their grammar. But once linguists hit upon this task, that cleared right up. When using truth value judgment, kids don't behave significantly differently from adults. They know that she can't be Lynn there, and so they reject those sentences. We'll stick some links to relevant papers down in the description if you want more details. But this is a good example of needing the right task to tease out what kids really know. And that's just some of the challenges we find when testing children's language. There are a lot of other tests we've developed, and we'll be talking about one of them, Elicited Production, back on our website. Kids do differ from adults in a lot of ways, and the way that they use language is affected by factors that grown-ups just shrug off. But the core of their grammar, the way that they use language, is the same as adults, which we can see if we just ask the right questions. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you judged my truth values properly, you learned that testing kids can be easier than testing babies, but presents its own challenges. That we can access kids' knowledge about sentence structures by getting them to act out what they hear. And that examining comprehension can give us a clearer picture of child grammar than just looking at production. The Link Space is produced by me, Moti Lieberman. It's directed by Delelise Prévost, and it's written by both of us. Our editor is Georges Coulomb, our production assistant is Stéphane Herdebees, our music is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier Muse. We're down in the comments below, or you can bring the discussion back over to our website where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, and if you want to keep expanding your own personal Link Space, please subscribe. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Hetchit no habethen!